Hey there, TSSG family. Welcome once again to the second Sunday International Sunday School Lesson Review with me, Pastor Sandra Candler Wafer. It's so good to be here with you one more time. Big shout out to Evangelist Wayne L. Henson and to all of the TSSG family that make this channel possible. Want to be a part of it? Well, press that thumbs up like button to let YouTube know that this is the kind of content that you like to see. Also, you can press that bell, ding, and subscribe. We have a good time studying the word of our Lord. You got to join us. All right, let's get ready and pray and get into this lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this time together, this time of study, Father God. Lord, continue to open our minds, our eyes, our hearts, Father God, to your word. Lord, teach us just a little bit more about faith on today, Father God. Lord, we will be careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello to every one of you. Hello, TSSG family. Hello, TSSG family. You're in the TSSG space. Well, hello, TSSG family. Sunday school with that Sunday school girl. Amen. All right. So our lesson this week is titled Faith of a Centurion for April 14th, 2024. The lesson scripture is coming from Luke 7, 1 through 10. And our key text is Luke 7 and 7. The background scripture, of course, is all of Luke 7, 1 through 10. So as we continue to look at examining our faith, we now turn our attention to others and what faith looks like when we have belief in Christ and trust in God. As we looked last week at the faith of the persistent, this week we look at the faith of a centurion, an unusual person to be looking towards faith, but a centurion nonetheless. We can see the pattern of faith and the depth of faith as we look at his actions and his behaviors. It's the actions of people that display their level of faith. They are doing something to reach Jesus. In these actions, their faith is easily seen. But let's also ask ourselves, what happened to cause them to exhibit this level of faith in Jesus? Some scripture to keep in mind are ones like Romans 10 and 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Or Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. There is a change that happens in our spirit when we hear the word of God and in his word is life. I even made me think about 2 Kings 23 in the Old Testament. King Josiah had received a message from God that there was no preventing the ruin of Jerusalem. Instead of making a big, long speech to the people, he ordered the book of the law to be read to them, and he personally read it himself. The word of God has the inherent power to generate faith in a humble heart. What does this tell you about us and the centurion, who's not a Jew, not a believer, but since Jesus came on the scene, something has happened to him and he has acquired faith. Our lesson aims for this week. First, identify the reason for Jesus' amazement. Explain the role of the town of Capernaum in Jesus' ministry. Brainstorm ways to exhibit faith as compared to that of the centurion. That's going to be our challenge for this week. Faith of a centurion. Now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. A certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, 
beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he do it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his most holy word. So for me, when I first think about faith of a centurion, right? A centurion? Really? They hated the Jews. They were brutal to them, especially during the time of oppression. And it's very well known and documented that those Roman soldiers were hated by the Jews also. All the places that had the people of God. Yet in the Bible, there are these accounts of centurions that reveal to us that some of them heard Christ's message and the power it had to cross all lines of social, ethnic, and political barriers. It changed their thinking enough to come to Christ and ask for his help, as we'll see in this example. So let's first talk a little bit about the background so we know where we are. Who's our author? We've talked about this author many times in previous lessons, but today we know that it is Luke. We'll just touch on a couple of key points for Luke, but if you want more background, there are some more details in the downloadable notes for this lesson. But Luke was a Gentile physician. We know that. He traveled with Paul. He wrote two books in the New Testament, Luke and Acts. He details the life and ministry of Christ as told to him by eyewitnesses. As a physician, Luke would have been trained as a careful observer. And Luke's writings of Jesus as God's ideal man who offers salvation to all of humanity, Jew and Gentile alike. Let's talk about the centurion a little bit. Now, the centurion's um, would have been a part of the Roman occupation force in Judea and Galilee in the first century when Israel was under Roman oppression. Roman soldiers were appointed as centurions by virtue of their bravery, their loyalty, their character, and their prowess in battle. As a result, Roman centurions were also well paid and held in high esteem. And they experienced high rates of injury and death during war. So maybe that's why they were paid so well. Our Bible mentions several centurions. And today we're going to focus on just this one centurion that's in Luke 7. Rome's army was made up also of what they called legions. And a legion had about 60 centurions in it. One commander, each centurion, commanded basically a group of roughly 100 soldiers. In the time of Jesus, a standard Roman legion consisted of about 6,000 men. These legions were the elite soldiers of the Roman army. And these, on, these, these soldiers understood order and authority. Centurions were also Gentiles. Many were presumably Roman, 
though history has shown that not all were ethnically Roman. Several centurions in the Bible recognized Christ's special purpose and honored him. We see that in Mark 15, 39, Acts 10 and 1, for example. This miracle today reveals that faith is sometimes found where we least expect it. Now, the city, Capernaum. The, the meaning of Capernaum is village of Nahum. This city is on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee. It has prominence, and it has prominence in our Bible as the headquarters of Jesus' ministry. Matthew 4 and 13 tells us that Jesus left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum. Five of the 12 disciples are even called from Capernaum, four of which were fishermen. It was very well known for its fish industry. It was also a main road along on the way to Damascus where the Romans set up tax collector booths to tax goods passing into the area. His disciple Matthew, the tax collector, is from there also. Now, our centurion in the lesson today is stationed there to live and has an encounter with Jesus. We don't know how much or how often, but we know that something has happened. Even as we read the Bible, one third of the 33 recorded miracles that Christ performed are in Capernaum. So, Let's get into this lesson, starting with the first few verses. Our scripture starts off with the word now. When you see your scripture starting with the word now, we need to go back and see what happened before this, because the text is making a transition. It's transitioning into this next account of Jesus. So in the chapter prior, scholars call Luke 6, 17 through 49, the Sermon on the Plain, where Jesus teaches people on a level place, instructing them about God's blessings, human relationships, ethics, and good character. Much like what was spoken in Matthew 5 through 7 during his Sermon on the Mount. There was a situation that was happening in Capernaum. Now that Christ has finished this teaching um, to the people, he enters into the city of Capernaum. So he likely wasn't very far away, not a long walk. And Jesus has moved from teaching the people. Now, as he's coming into the city, he's then approached by several people. There's this request and an endorsement that comes to him. He is told the servant of one of the Roman centurions is ill and about to die. Most centurions, when their servants got sick, they either let them die or killed them off, just like they might do for a sick animal. No one was holding them accountable, accountable for it. And the Roman soldiers were trained themselves that they were superior to any and everyone that they conquered, especially in regard to the Jews who they hated. So we see something different really happening with this centurion and his relationship with his servant. We know his servant is very ill. And in Matthew's account, he notes that the servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully, tormented, and sick and ready to die. Three words really describe the servant's sickness. Paralyzed, in pain, in danger of dying. That's coming from Matthew 8 and 6. Another thing we can note in Luke's description is that this servant was dear to the centurion. So we can also discern this servant had a special place in the heart of this Roman soldier. He shows value, care, and compassion for his servant. Who is it exactly that approached Jesus? The elders of the Jews. The Jewish elders were likely the town fathers or leaders, probably local men of good reputation, synagogue leaders, who were held in very high esteem. They came to Jesus by request of the centurion. We can also see from this that these elders have some level of relationship and respect for the centurion as they are beseeching Jesus to come and heal the servant. 
Seems like they are living without a lot of stress with this centurion and really kind of a harmonious situation compared to many of the Jews that were ruled with a brutal hand by many of the centurions. We can clearly see they have a high regard for this centurion and his care for his servant. And so the elders are insistent. They are standing in for the centurion. Considering the climate of the times and Jesus' heritage, why should they do anything for a Roman centurion? But these men don't seem to hesitate to come before Jesus and vouch for this man. They mention that the centurion is worthy of a healing from Jesus. They even go on to explain why. He loved the Jewish nation. They even explain that the centurion had built them the synagogue. This was no small undertaking for the people to build and furnish a synagogue. And this centurion assisted in some way, likely financially, to get the items needed to build the synagogue. We see that he has a very deep respect for this nation and for their God. They had to have known this man, his integrity and his reliability. His previous encounters and actions with the people of the city had to have been very clear to the elders for them to stand in and vouch and represent his issue to Jesus. What a lesson for us also. Integrity means a lot, right? So these elders, like the friends that lowered the man from the rooftop last week, so that he would be before Jesus and healed, bring the centurion's issue, their, his request to Jesus. They are indirectly saying, he may be a Gentile, he may be a Roman soldier, a centurion, but he's worth it. It's good to have brothers and sisters in Christ that know how to bring your issue before the Lord. Amen. Amen. So this insightful centurion does another surprising thing. As Jesus is on his way, because now Jesus has said, yes, let's go. He's the, he, he is going along with these elders because they have come and vouched for him now. And he is on his way to the centurion's home. As they go, they're met by a group of friends of the centurion's. Jesus is very close. He's almost there. He can just about reach out and touch this servant and heal him. But the friends stop them right where they are. We can see that the centurion understands the culture of also the, the Israelites. He likely knows that entering the house of a Gentile will cause the Jew to be unclean. Ceremonially, of course. This centurion also sees himself as unworthy. Much like Peter did in Luke 5 and 8, when Jesus instructed him to let down the nets for a catch. And Peter was obedient because of the word of Jesus. But when Peter saw what Jesus did, he acknowledged who Jesus was and saw himself as unworthy. He didn't see himself worthy that Jesus should come into this house, the centurion, nor did he see himself worthy to come to Jesus face to face. But what he did understand is power and authority. For he was a man with influential power and authority over his own soldiers. He understood this. He also knew his own authority had limits. He completely understood that. But he may have, living there in Capernaum, and that being Jesus' headquarters, he may have seen Jesus do some things through his power and his authority. And it's like he knew that it had no limits. He understood that if Jesus just said the word, this centurion knew that if he just said a word to his men, they would carry out his order. And that's what he sees in Christ. 
All he needs to do is say the word. No doubt, this centurion saw and heard about the ministry of Jesus. He's right there in Capernaum with him. By his words, he is placing his confident trust in the ability of Jesus, that all he has to do is speak a word and it will be done. This is great faith that he is is displaying in this moment. A key point here is that it is impossible to please God without faith. We know that from Hebrews 11 and 6. Even today, many doubt whether God's word is sufficient. If we have a problem, we often run to hear what is it that the world says, or we do a Google search, or we ask somebody that we want to find out if they know the answer of what it is that we should do. Many Christian churches, it's almost like they don't have as much confidence in God's word. Some churches today use a lot of flashy entertainment and antics to draw people into the membership, believing is that's what's essential to their success. Yet, through this centurion, we see that if we only speak a word, that is the true essence of spiritual success. Without the word of God, the church will not maintain a solid foundation of truth and grow. So now, verse 9, we see that Jesus is marveled at the faith of this Gentile Roman centurion. (laughs) We see Jesus astonished in two ways. First, at the fact that his own people lacked this much faith. The nation should have understood Jesus' power and his authority, and they should have been able to recognize it The religious leaders should have known and understood what the scrolls said about the coming Messiah and believe it. Second, the centurion came as a little child and put his full faith in Jesus to heal his dear servant. Christ compliments the centurion's faith because he has faith in the word of God, in Christ's word. When the centurion says he is unworthy of Christ's presence, he recognizes the power of the spoken word because he's familiar with that authority, as I said previously. And he also believed that Christ's word has the power and the authority even over this disease, this illness that his dear servant has. One thing to think about is that no one can have real faith if they reject the Word of God. The Word of God is what is key here. We have got to believe and have confidence in the Word of God. Let me say that one more time. No one can have real faith if they reject the Word of God. Jesus turns now and looks at the people that came with him, the disciples, the elders, and whoever else was with them going on the way to the centurion's house. He expresses to them that he has not found such great faith, not in Israel. This centurion was one of the most unlikely persons to amaze Jesus, a Gentile, a pagan upbringing, a Roman, a man of war. Not exactly the resume you might be looking for as one of the Bible's great heroes of faith. But yet he believed that all Jesus had to do was speak a word. Then finally in verse 10, by the time his friends returned to this house of the centurion, the servant was already healed. Dr. Luke records for us that the servant is already healed. It is done. When Jesus saw the faith, when Jesus heard the faith of the centurion, he immediately healed his servant and made him whole. (laughs) And we see throughout various accounts in the New Testament that Jesus has healed and told people that their faith 
has made them well or made them whole. The woman with the issue of blood in Matthew 9 and 22, a leper in Luke 17 and 19, the blind beggar in Luke 18 and 42, a Canaanite woman's daughter, Matthew 15 and 28. As we study this lesson this week, this is a healing account where the healing almost seems to take a backseat to the more obvious focus, the faith of the centurion. He didn't have a face-to-face encounter with Christ in that moment, but something happened to him that he saw, that he heard while he's the centurion of Capernaum, and this is Jesus' headquarters, he had to have overheard, saw, and then believed what he saw and heard from Christ. And in this moment, he believed and had the faith to believe that Jesus had the power and the authority to heal his servant just by speaking the word. The centurion understood that he did not have to physically be there to command his soldiers. So he understood Jesus' authority to speak a word. This faith that he displays leaves us to ask ourselves about our own faith. Life will have its challenges and circumstances and situations, but how will we face them? We have to ask ourselves, how do we face these challenges that come along? How do we increase our faith to make our faith more like this centurion? If we're called upon to pray for a fellow believer, our family member, how do we exercise this centurion faith, knowing that it's going to be a remote healing because Christ is no longer here? But do we believe that his word has the power and the authority to touch, heal, deliver, and set free. What do we have to do differently to have that kind of faith that fully trusts God, no matter what the circumstances look like? The centurion is also a reminder to us that man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. 1 Samuel 16 and 7, Jesus saw the heart of that centurion. And because of his heart, and his faith, his trust, and his confidence in Jesus, his dear servant was healed. Well, that's the lesson, family. (laughs) There are extra details in the notes and even a short devotional about how to help each of us increase our faith. If this is an area that you need help in, download those notes and get that devotional. And again, don't forget to press that thumbs up like button and click on that bell notification or join us at TSSG Connect so you don't miss out on any of our content. And we have a great time. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this time of study together. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you shower upon us. Lord, help increase our faith that we may continue to trust, to believe, to have full and complete confidence in you and in your word, O oh God. You don't have to be here, Lord, but we know that you're with us. We carry you with us everywhere we go. And Lord, we know that you hear us. You hear our cries. You hear our pleas. Father, you hear our prayers of supplication. And Lord, we thank you for being a wonderful God, a true, living, patient, wonderful, forgiving God. We thank you for the many blessings. We thank you for these that are watching the video, Father God. We thank you for all those that will be blessed in Sunday school. Lord, continue to look over your people. And we thank you and give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we'll see you all in Sunday school. So until next time, blessings, family. Thank you so much for sharing in this space with us today. If this ministry has blessed you in any way, I invite you to consider sharing a small gift of just $3 with us. You can do so by scanning one of the QR codes on the screen. And please don't forget, 
We are waiting for you to join us over in the TSSG Connect. You can see all the benefits here on the screen, and we look forward to serving you in a more personal way. Have you had an opportunity to visit our amazing swag shop? Stop by and check out great items for Sunday school and church t-shirts, pouches, mugs, and so much more. Find something that you'll enjoy or something for your favorite teacher. Changing the way you see Sunday school with that Sunday school.